Hello, this is the recording for International Monetary Economics Lecture 9. So, uh, last time for Lecture 8, you would have seen uh, exchange rate theory, so purchasing power over parity, uncovered interest parity, and covered interest parity, and you would have seen simple multiplier accelerator systems, and that was with me. Uh, in Lecture 8, you would have seen open economy macro, the basic ISLM BP model, and beyond, and that was with my colleague Donald Palchik. This time, I want to show you some more business cycle data, I want to show you two really cool models, actually, that, and I'll show you why they're cool later on. And uh, these two models are Goodwin's growth cycle and Minsky's financial fragility model. So now, the data. Here's Ireland's real output for the last um, 30 years. And the 2008-09 figures are deliberately omitted because they're so shockingly negative. Um, what I want to show you here is the focus on ups and downs. So you can see from 1980 to 1990 the change in year-on-year -year GDP growth. Um, over the years it's cycling up and down and up and down and up and down. So real output all over the shop. Now this is the more recent stuff. Um, again you can see that obviously there's been a very large downturn from uh, 2008. GDP and GNP were more or less um, on the way down and then for the third and fourth quarters of 2009 we're talking about minus 10 percent um, uh, negative growth which is just frightening so fixed investment over the time um, which is investment in physical capital has been increasing um, you can see the bump there in the 1980s when things drop off but more or less we've seen a very large increase in logged fixed investment over the 30-year period we've also seen government consumption increase again year on year and inventory changes this is cycling so we're seeing it move uh, in inventory we're seeing things move all over the place now the missing data is a reporting error actually so don't worry about that but what you should perceive is the up and down movement and total consumption again has been increasing over the pre over the period now there are two competing explanations for this the first is that uh, the first and most dominant one is what's called the real business cycle um, theory. So this was this is the notion that the economy is in continuous equilibrium. So that that means everything always trends back to a mean. There is a shock, but it's more or less stochastic, and that shock can be considered an information shock. Okay, so people make decisions based on the best available information. Those decisions might turn out to be right, they might turn out to be wrong, but eventually they'll learn which ones are which, and they'll uh, avoid and reduce the error over time. So the economy will always trend back towards equilibrium. And the errors, therefore, are actually information gaps. So people wouldn't make the same mistakes if they had the same information. The other view is that the economy is in permanent disequilibrium. So someone like Minsky will say, look, you finance, tech in, you finance uh, new investment, and that produces new techniques. These new techniques allow the generation of excess demand. This causes a huge increase in spending. We see an increase in profits, that feeds back. The price of assets increase. The demand price of investment increases. So the moment you hit full employment, you hit, you hit a, an expansion of debt financing. Um, this is probably weak at first because um, the memory of the preceding financial difficulties are normally in the bank managers' minds. Um, so they're very cautious, but as the economy is going up it's a self-fulfilling prophecy everyone gets their money back everyone's a genius and everyone recovers their investment reinvests it again because things are always on the up which causes uh, an investment boom that causes inflation because you're at full employment and then the inflationary boom leads to a, a fragile financial structure that allows the system to blow up and i think that's a pretty good explanation of what we've seen in the last two years so now in the 1940s um Two chaps called Burns and Mitchell came up with the notion of uh, a business cycle. And, and um, although it had been around for many hundreds of years, they really codified it into the, into the modern framework. So we see the first pr part of the, any business cycle is the quest for profits. We see business receipts and business expenses. These are the two things that businesses look at most often. And they're two set, different set, sets of prices. Businesses are always looking at the volume of sales. Sales are going up, that's good. If they're going down, that may be bad. Uh, currency availability, can you get cash? Can you get credit? If any of these things are not present or if they're moving in the wrong way, you probably don't see a, a huge ex increase in um, productive capacity. 
revival. So this is the second part of the, uh, of the cycle. Suddenly costs start to go down and we start to see inventories reducing because people are starting to buy stuff. Interest rates go down, which means it's cheaper to borrow. Certainly the banks are in very strong lending positions because they just got themselves out of the hole that they dug for themselves in the previous uh, bust. Suddenly, investment-seeking funds start growing. They start coming all over the place and we start um, looking for ways to invest these funds properly. Suddenly, the, accum the, there's a, the economy starts accumulating stresses. Either we reach full employment and we start inflating or we have an unfortunate event like 9-11 or the, the uh, mad cow crisis and we see slow increases in capital and labour costs over time, making uh, one's exports more uncompetitive. Wage costs rise, cost of materials rise, everything becomes more expensive in the system. Business management suffers. People stop hunting for bargains because they don't need to because their profits are so high. The consumers, they lose their price sensitivity. They stop looking at the receipts um, because they, they, they just feel rich. Suddenly, um, business capital is overstressed because it's so cheap to borrow, it makes a lot of sense to build a big factory. Um, and because your expectations are wrong, that means you're in deep trouble when things go very badly wrong because you don't have any redundancy built into your balance sheets. The system reaches its peak when you see an uh, overstock in certain markets. Now, for in certain markets, you can read the property market in Ireland. Um, we, we see an increase in interest rates, which we are seeing right now. Um, maybe constru construction costs go up or capital out outlegs go up. Certainly these things have gone down in the Irish case. We see a massive decline in demand. The wheels come off the bus very, very quickly. There's no such thing as a bubble deflating. The bubble just pops, okay? So the economy contracts rapidly through the damaged sectors and I've shown you that rapid contraction already um, for the last two years in Ireland in our GDP and GNP. And finally, we see the depression and recession. So unfavorable expectations collapse aggregate demand. Um, the marginal efficiency of capital goes very low and suddenly we see cost dropping because Unemployment's rising, and we're putting the brakes on the public sector expenditures. Uh, stocks are dropping because they're getting sold off. People come up with new ideas, new processes. The system resets, and off we go again. So there are two basic theoretical metaphors or ways to describe these this process. The first is as a rocking horse. Yes, things go up and down. There's a cycle. The rocking horse goes back and forth, left and right, but with decreasing amplitude. In other words, it returns to its equilibrium after you push it the first time. The second metaphor is a snooker table. So here the, the output in the system is bouncing up and down between two barriers. There's an upper bound and a lower bound, the upper bound being full employment, the lower bound being um, subsistence level of the economy. So these saturation effects force this snooker ball, which is the growth rate of capital, to hit a wall, bounce back, and it continues going. So let's have a look at one model. The Goodwin's growth model is essentially robbed from um, theoretical biology. So the idea is you have two populations of um, animals, rabbits and foxes, or different types of fish, as in the original example. Some are predators and some are prey. So we couple the equations that describe the interactions with these particular uh, prey. So the idea is, if you go back to the rabbits and foxes metaphor, rabbits um, like eating grass and foxes like eating rabbits. If the, if the foxes eat too many rabbits, then they starve because there's nothing else to eat. And if the um, rabbits eat too much grass and there aren't enough foxes, then the rabbits multiply all over the place, there's not enough grass, and the rabbits all starve. So this feedback and interaction effect is what causes uh, things to become interesting. Sorry about this, folks. So, this feedback is what forces things to become interesting. So now, we assume there's two non-specific factors of production. So labor and capital, which can uh, move around according to the marginal productivity of capital and labor argument. Quantities are real and net, and all wages are consumed, all profits being reinvested in the system. So we have a sense of, a, if you like, a pie that we're dividing up at every period. So there's some growth rate beta of the labor force that's uh, accumulating at the steady rate n, sorry, N0 e to the bt, and the steady technical progress. So capital and labor ratio is, is evolving, again, according to this very nice uh, alpha parameter. The capital output ratio, k, which is what k is, this, is the division of uh, output divided by labor, is constant. So the real wage must always rise in the neighborhood of full employment. So when you get near the full employment barrier, 
the real weight will rise. So at, e at every period, uh, at the end of every period, workers will get some portion of the economy, U. So the economic output, if you imagine it's a pie, if U was 3 or 0.3, then, then they would get 30% of the output and the capitalists would re receive 70% of the output for the reference or vice versa. So what we're looking at is how U and V change over time. If U gets bigger, the workers get more stuff. If V gets bigger, the capitalists get more stuff. And here's our equation system. So V dot is the change in the uh, amount of output that's going to capitalists. And that's one divided by the intensive capital labor ratio minus the amount of technical progress plus the uh, growth rate of the, of the labor force, one minus uh, the amount of intensive capital in the system times the amount of output accruing to workers that you have to pay. So that's the wage bill, essentially, minus 1 over k times u. You multiply all that by v, which is what you had in the last period. u, again, is uh, the change in output over time, u dot, and that's minus the level of steady technical progress, plus gamma, which is a, a, um, an intensity factor, plus uh, rho, which is the uh, level of capital intensity in the system, times v. And then you all multiply all that by u, and you have this lovely system. So here's what Goodwin, the guy who came up with it, talked about. He says, when profit is greatest, then, i.e. Uh, u is equal to u, then employment is average. The high growth rate pushes employment to its maximum, uh, v2, which squeezes the profit rate to its average value. So this deceleration in the growth employment relative to its average value again, where profit and growth are again at their nadir. This low growth rate leads to a fall in output and employment well below full employment, thus restoring profitability to its average value because productivity is now rising faster than real wage rates. The improved profitability carries the seed of its own destruction by engendering a too vigorous expansion of output and employment and thus destroying the reserve army of labour and strengthening labour's bargaining power. And off we go again. Now, here's something I've computed for you. You should be able to download this little notebook on the web, but what you can see is that there's a cycling is a cycling. The blue thing is what the workers get and the red thing is what the capitalists get over time. As one goes up, the other goes down. So they, they share the products of the economy. Okay, The motion is cyclical and it's bounded. So this is um, something that we'd call a limit cycle, but we're not going to get into this in this particular class. The Goodwin growth model exhibits what's called a limit cycle. Why is it cool? Well, number one, we have a feedback driven limit, driven limit cycle. So Workers are dependent on capitalists and vice versa, but the system itself is reproducing over time. Okay, we see a, a, it's a quite Marxian story, but it's it's cast in a very interesting light because here the predators in the system are not capitalists; they're actually uh, the workers. And the model can be extended to search and selection, and I've done that in in a paper, so you can have a look at, at uh, the details of that um, later on if you are so inclined. So that's the first model, and that's why it's cool. Here's the second model. This is the Minsky model of financial fragility. The setup is very simple. The debt structure of the firm matters. The market is naturally unstable. We have big bank and big government that dampen these cycles. When things blow up, the big bank, like the central bank, and big government, like uh, the US government, simply fly in and save everybody. So extreme risk is never a problem. It's never something you have to deal with as, your, as a bank. Booms and busts, therefore, are the inevitable result of institutionally legitimized high-risk lending practices. Now, let's assume there's some con constant markup tau over the wage bill W. So tau could be 0.2, which would be 20%. So every time you buy something for uh, 100 euros, which you produce using labor, so your wage bill is going to be 100 euros per hour or per day or whatever, you simply whack on 20%. So the price that the punter will see is uh, 120. That's P. That's equation three there. Now the profit rate R is given up by adding up the contributions to profit from the various sectors of the economy. Here we have the price of output, Px, minus Wbx, which is the contribution of the wage bill to producing that output. That's profit. But you divide that, you have to divide that by the price of capital. This is the price of your factory and the price of what it costs you to actually rent that factory out. Doing a little bit of substitution, you see that it's tau times the wage bill times the amount of output divided by one plus tau over the wage bill times the uh, level of gross output. And simplifying out, uh, just by w, just by um, uh, crossing out WB, you see that it's tau over one plus tau times X over K, which is the intensive capital ratio. Here's the big idea, folks. The core of Minsky's theory revolves 
around how expected returns relate to the capital stock. Now look at where the capital stock is in equation four. It's on the bottom, it's the denominator. That's important for what follows. So equation five there uh, starts capturing this notion that the price of capital is always going to be the return, R, on the riskless interest rate plus rho times the price level divided by the nominal interest rate, I. You do a little bit of rearranging, you get equation six there, which says the price of capital times the price level. So that you, can, you can proxy that by the, by the um, CPI or whatever. So that's the uh, return to capital plus the intensive capital ratio minus the uh, interest rate on bonds or the interest rate on um, your loans multiplied by the price level times uh, I again. Rearranging all that again, you can say that investment demand is the price of investment PI, which is level equal to G0, the amount of autonomous growth in the system, plus H, which is, the which is some level or some, some parameter. So this is the amount that you're going to spend, if you like, um, on the price of capital. And saving supply is just going to be the amount that you saved uh, out of every out of every uh, euro that you've earned in profit. So that's going to be savings rate, which is going to be like 0.5 or 0.2 or whatever, times tau, which is the markup rate, times the wage bill, times the level of gross output. And that's equation eight. So now equilibrium in this system is where the amount of growth in the system is equal to the amount of saving in the system. Okay, so we have this lovely, uh, lovely equation 10, which says that growth in the system is the savings rate minus the amount that you spend on investment, H. So that's really cool. Any fall in the interest rate or any increase in anticipated profits will lead to higher growth because G is always equal to SR from the saving function. So the profit rate and capacity utilization will go up as well. One thing drags up the other, but of course it goes the other way too. So we have some amount of fiscal debt in the system, F. You can convert debt into money or short-term bonds. Bonds are always hold, held by the rentiers in the system. The value of all plant and equipment is the price of capital times the amount of capital that you have, and that's always going to be equal to the amount you've invested, which is R plus rho times PK divided by I. The firm has some equity, e, and that has a market price, PE. So we have some, sense, some rough sense of a stock market here. The difference between capital stock and equity is always going to be firm's net worth, N. And then firm's balance sheet, and how that changes over time, so that's the price of capital times the amount you have invested, plus the change in the price of capital over time. That's always going to be equal to the change in price of capital times the amount you have, P dot K times K. And that's going to be equal to the amount of equities you have, PE times E dot, plus the amount of the change in the price of equities, P dot E times E, plus N dot. Now, that's important. Firm's net worth can change over time. This is, a, and a, this is actually a balance sheet identity. The total wealth of every rentier is the amount of cash they have, M, plus the amount of bonds they hold, B, plus the value of their stock and sh stocks and shares, P, E, E, P, sub E, E. Um, and if we just allow fiscal debt to equal M plus B, then we can just collect all that and let it be there in equation 12, P, E times E plus F. Rentier's wealth changes over time according to this differential, equation 13. And that says... But rentiers will get rich from increases in capital gains and financial saving, and they will be ruined from decreases in capital gains and financial saving. At any point in time, you have a choice as a rentier. You have a certain amount of capital in your, in your, in your pocket, and you can either hold it as cash, which is equation 14, you can hold it as equities, equation 15, or you can hold it as bonds. And each of these proportions, of course, has to sum to one. And these are asset demand equations. So 14, 15, and 16 there determine the interest rate and the anticipated rate of profit on fiscal capital, R plus rho. So here's the thing. We can think of R plus rho as representing returns to equity in some expectational sense, okay? Higher returns, higher rows, bid up the value of the firm's capital stock. But again, everything's tied together. So Lash equation... 12 into equation 15 and you have that the wage bill over time is a function of the fiscal debt divided by uh, 1 minus epsilon which is some parameter times i r and p and rho sorry so here we see the returns to equity in the system are actually on the denominator side and remember what i told you earlier on about the denominator side 
fiscal debt is fiscal stance if you like of the system is always determined by the expected returns to capital and the actual capital gains so now rentier's net worth are always determined by the valuation of their profits and their anticipated profits at any moment in time now if you think you're going to make more money later on you're going to feed the demand for asset supplies and demands you're going to actually bid up the price by asking for more of it because you want more because you expect things to rise so we see the price of equities as in some sense dependent on the expectational change of firms net worth given their current investment levels and their issuances of new equity so equation 19 there gives us excess demand in the money markets so that's the sum of what you actually hold in cash divided by the fiscal stance times uh, the um, levels of uh, the interest rate, the return on capital, and the expectation of firms' anticipated profits. So this picks out a really cool ISLM relation. Uh, and this is from Taylor's book, um, Reconstructing Macroeconomics. This, really, this, this is a really nice ISLM relation. We've got the interest rate I on one one axis the profit rate R we see the financial market moving over time and the commodity market so here what happens when the expected profit rate rho increases suddenly we see this huge shift out in the commodity market and a corresponding decrease in the financial market because we're seeing seeing one thing move from the financial market to the real market any change in expected profits is going to give, be given by rho dot and that's always going to be given by the change in population uh, in the long run okay now government policy if we call the money debt ratio alpha we can say that m divided by f and remember we can separate out f if we like is going to be pk over k times f so it's going to be m over pk times one minus lowercase f and let lowercase f be the level of outstanding fiscal debt in the capital stock if you fix the government expenditure as some proportion of the capital stock so that's a policy you simply say we're only going to spend uh, or borrow a certain amount relative to our capital stock and you can always have taxes of expenditures built in here if you like then you'll always have a, a, a fiscal policy rule so you'll always have the amount of money that you print in the system or the amount of money that you borrow evolving according to alpha hat there which is saying that as money grows alpha hat will fall as g increases so you can actually grow your way out of your problems this is very important equation 22 there is saying you can grow your way out of the problems that you create for yourself from the past but that's not easy equation 22 is also a sort of a background rationale for the uh, celtic tiger so it turns out yes if you do the jacobian on this um so uh, you simply compute the matrix of partial derivatives around an equilibrium where i is equal to i bar g is equal to m hat uh, you get uh, the jacobian matrix there and that is stable and it says any increase in rho which is in, in some sense of investor confidence will lower the interest rate that raises the derivative of rho in equation 20 and you get a positive feedback of course if you can have positive feedback you can have negative feedback crises in this system can come at any moment here are the adjusted dynamics so here's the anticipated incremental profit rate rho here's the ratio of money to assets, outside assets alpha the two lines there determine the uh, stable states of the system that's where alpha hat is equal to naught and rho is equal to naught you can see that the system will cycle around from a to b to c it always has this cycle but the movement from a to b is almost instantaneous the movement from b to c is very very slow and the movement from c back to a is very very slow so any drop in investor confidence moves the economy to point b authorities will always try through policy to increase the money supply and hence the money to debt ratio alpha hat you've seen this in ireland for the last two years we've gone from 30 to 85 percent of uh, uh, debt to gdp this would move the economy to point c and back to equilibrium however if the economy does not turn the corner at c and it doesn't have to then the economy enters a debt deflation scenario so that's equation, uh, that's uh, lecture nine. Thank you very much.